Chapter 3, Professional Ethics and Legal and Regulatory Issues. This chapter is going to cover professional ethics as it relates to phlebotomy and practices in the laboratory field. These are just chapter learning objectives that you can review on your own. Laws versus ethics. Laws are societal rules or regulations that are advisable or are obligatory to observe. So an example of this would be speed limit signs. Um, laws protect the welfare and safety of society, resolve conflicts in an orderly and nonviolent manner, and constantly evolve in accordance with the increasing um, pluralistic society. So laws are in place to protect society. That's why we have traffic laws. Also, two laws in place about age that... Um, people can drive. Ethics, on the other hand, are moral standards of behaviors or conduct that govern an individual's action. Where bioethics refers to life are the more moral issues or problems that have resulted because of modern medicine, clinical research, and or technology. So ethics would be we have a standard as phlebotomists to provide procedures that we don't force a patient to get their blood run without their consent where bioethics is more moral issues. So this would start looking into, you know, research to clone organs, the controversy of using modern medicine for fertility. Um, that would be an example of bioethics. There's the ethics check. Um, as healthcare providers, is this legal? Does it comply with institutional policy? Does it foster a win-win situation with the patient, supervisor, or other individuals? How would I feel about myself if I read about this decision in the newspaper, and how would my family feel? These are questions that we would ask ourselves to kind of determine whether we're going to get a win-win situation out of this. Forcing a patient to get their blood drawn against their will would be not a win-win. Can I live with myself after making this decision, and is it right? We have an obligation as healthcare providers to do no harm. So those are things we got to take into consideration. Patients' rights. All members of the healthcare team recognize that their first responsibility is of their patient's health, safety, and personal dignity. This is where we provide privacy and also adhering to HIPAA, not talking about patients um, outside of their immediate care with the people that are responsible for it. The American Hospital Association, AHA, Patient's Bill of Rights, is titled Patient Care Partnership. The Patient's Bill of Rights is right to treatment, um, key elements including quality health care, clean health care environment, patient's role in his or, his or her own care, privacy rights, and availability of assistance when leaving the hospital or billing issues. So for example, a patient that had a hip replacement might need assistance when leaving the hospital to determine how many stairs they have to go up, what type of therapy, could the therapy be delivered in their home, could they offer um, phlebotomy in their home because the patient can't come to the hospital. I'm sorry, this next slide is kind of bouncing back, so I will go back to that slide in just a second. There's three types of branches of the government. The legislative branch, written laws, are called statutes and are made at the federal, state, and um, county levels. Executive branch makes the administrative laws. And then the judicial branch establishes case law based on legal cases from the lower level judicial branches. I'm going to go ahead and kind of go back to that slide that we missed, which is the National Patient Safety Goals, the NPSGs. This identifies patients correctly, improves safe staff communication, and prevents infection. This is where we have that kind of three-step of patient identification, making sure that we ID our patient at all times. We'll go back to our slideshow here. Basic legal principles, the laws governing medicine and medical ethics complement and overlap one another. Healthcare consumers and patients have become more aware, more critical, and much more willing to sue anyone that their lawyer believes has been at fault, including healthcare workers who are collecting blood specimens. An example of a phlebotomy-related lawsuit would be the technician draws in the basilic vein with a 21-gauge needle, starts probing or um, manipulating the needle in the arm, and ultimately 
um, hits a nerve or hits the artery, that could be grounds for the patient to not only sue the hospital, but also the technician. Negligence is a violation of duty to the exercise reasonable skill and care in performing a task. So for example, negligence on a phlebotomist end would be, we realized that when we went into the patient's room, they have bed rails on the inpatient beds and our exercise um, reasonable skill and care in performing our tasks. Violation of this would be if we forgot to put those bed rails back up or we had a patient tell us I have a mastectomy on my right arm and we ignored that fact and drew that arm anyways. The following fact, factors must be considered in a large negligence case. Duty, which is basically we have a obligation to the patient to perform our duties within a skillful practice. Breach of duty, somehow that practice was violated and foreseeability. For example, I will use the last example I provided with using the basilic vein. So in our job as a phlebotomist, we have three veins we can use. Our duty is to choose the less risky one. Breach of duty would be we go ahead and we draw that basilic vein and probe around in the arm and foreseeability. We know an artery and nerve sit underneath it, so we can foresee that there could be potential damage and we go and do so anyways. Proximate causation, injury or harm and damages. Proximate causation, as your book talks about, is that we realize that there is a cause to our actions. Injury or harm, so for the example I provided, you would actually could cause a patient to lose um, feeling in that arm. And damages would be if the patient were to lose capability in that arm, they could sue for damages because they couldn't work or perform their job skills as needed. Malpractice is an improper unskillful care of a patient by a member of the healthcare team and any professional misconduct or unreasonable lack of skill. So for example, if a physician performed a surgery and the surgery was supposed to be on the right arm and they performed it on the left, that could be malpractice. They had an obligation to do their job correctly and due to unreasonable lack of skill, they did not. We're going to go ahead and move to HIPAA, which is the Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act. This was created legal requirements for protection, security, and appropriate sharing of patients' personal health information. Use of electronic transfer of patients' medical information is a major part of HIPAA. The biggest thing to know with HIPAA is that this is includes patient labels, so patients with identifying features, so first, last name, date of birth, cannot leave our clinical sites. This would also include if I were working in the healthcare industry and I saw one of my students there, I could not tell other people about that as well. This image shows an example of making sure that when we log on, we don't share passwords and that when we leave our computers that the screens aren't visible for others to see. Patients written consent. So prior to a surgery, a patient needs a sign for consent um, that they understand that there are HIPAA rights, um, healthcare workers confidentiality and non-disclosure statements. They maintain the confidentiality of all patients' information. Computer passwords, again, are secure from others' knowledge. We cannot share our passwords at work. We all have different access to different things. Patient confidentiality. Confidential materials include communication between the physician and patient, the patient's verbal statements and medical computer entries on patients, and nonverbal communication such as laboratory test results. Those can't be posted in any type of public places or even in our lab. Those are confidential and can only be shared with the physician and people working with that patient for their immediate medical care. Confidentiality and HIV exposure. State law regarding confidentiality and HIV status varies from state to state. If exposure to blood occurs through a needle stick, lancet, or another means, the home health care worker needs to be certain of obtaining the patient's HIV status and other potentially infectious disease to ensure proper, immediate, and long-term self-protective procedural steps can be taken. This is generally done within 24 hours of the injury. The other thing to keep mindful of is that with patients with HIV status, they are not necessarily on any isolation procedures. We are supposed to use universal and standard precautions for all our patients. 
but when we do get a needle stick injury, it needs to be reported, including if a device didn't work correctly or what happened to cause that needle stick injury, and then your human resource department would follow up with care. If employed by a healthcare facility, the healthcare worker would follow the guidelines established by the facility. The healthcare worker is self-employed and is important to monitor his or her own HIV or infectious disease status and counseling should be sought. Standard of care. All healthcare workers must conform to a specific standard of care to protect patients. Examples of setting standard of care is statutes, licensing requirement, and rules and regulations of regulatory or professional organizations. So for example, as phlebotomists, we have rules and regulations on things we can and cannot perform in our lab, as well as part of being ASCP certified professional organizations is keeping up with continuing education so that we can provide our patients the specific standard of care to protect them as well. Informed consent, this is voluntary permission given by a patient to allow touching, examination, or treatment by healthcare providers. This requires a signature of approval, so an example would be a surgery. Prior to going in for a dental procedure, they might have you sign off on the procedure, explain the complications thereof. Another example of this would be if you donated your blood, they have you sign consent knowing exactly what you're going to have done and that the technician needs to touch your arm. This is an example of a document um, that's in the hospital setting that authorizes the performance of a procedure on a patient. Informed consent for research purposes, the IRBs, Institutional Research Boards, ensure that human subjects do not bear any appropriate risk and consent is um, required for this. We cannot perform research without the patient's consent. And this is an example of a provider going over the what the research includes and then getting their consent prior to starting any procedures. Implied consent occurs when a patient's nonverbal behavior indicates agreement. So this exists when immediate action is required to save a patient's life or to prevent permanent impairment of the patient's health. Implied consent differs legally from one state to another. So for an example, a patient that comes into our ER that cannot speak for themselves because they are unconscious, it is implied consent that they want to be treated. Implied consent also applies to phlebotomy because if a patient were to extend their arm out, that is nonverbal consent that they're okay getting their blood drawn. We also confirm this by stating who we are and also asking them if we can, is it okay if I draw your blood today? That's implied consent as well, getting verbal consent from them that we can perform the procedure. Statute of limitations, a law that defines how soon after an injury due to malpractice of a plaintiff must file the lawsuit or forever be barred from doing so. Generally, it's about seven years. This just is a courtroom proceeding. Legal claims and defense. Steps in malpractice lawsuit, there's discovery. So this is where they get their um, evidence. Deposition, this might be of healthcare workers, experts in the field, witnesses. Expert witness and expert witness may assist a plaintiff in proving wrongful act of a defendant or may assist the defendant in refuting such evidence. A great example of this, um, the Netflix special Making a Murder, they provided an expert witness that followed up was the EDTA tube that they suspected tampered with, so it was great to see something in the phlebotomy field in a kind of um, expert witness highlight. Evidence, complete, relevant, and important and examples include vacuum tube holders and tubes if they were part of the incident and the Joint Commission standards and phlebotomy safety devices. Please see textbook 3.1 in your textbook for more detailed references to this. Respondent superior, let the master answer. This is legal doctrine that holds the employers responsible for the act of their employees within the scope of employment relationship. Indemnification is the compensation for financial loss suffered by the Employees Act. This concludes part one of chapter three. Please view part two of chapter three to continue with this PowerPoint slideshow.